And welcome to Vista Church. We're so glad you've joined us online today. You must be awesome because, you know, birds of a feather. <laughs> Whatever your background or the journey that brought you here today, you will find a place of acceptance, tolerance, and love. Because we believe you are definitely worth it.
Yo, welcome to Vista Church. It's the best Sunday. Another one at Vista Church with Pastor's nigga Bianca. Welcome to Vista Church. We're so glad that you have joined us today. Uh, my name is Pastor Nick. I'm married to the beautiful 
Pastor B, Pastor Bianca, the love of my life. It's nearly our 19th uh, wedding anniversary. Come on, beginning of March. Well, we're so glad that you are here today. If you're watching for the first time, I want to extend a warm welcome to you. If you've been watching for the first time in a long time, welcome back. Listen, I know this season has been crazy hard, but I want to encourage you today. Sometimes it feels like you're going around in circles. I want to tell you, you are not going around in circles. You are ascending a circular uh, stairwell. It's kind of like going upstairs in a circular fashion. Yes, it may feel like it's the same thing, the same problems, the same difficulties, but I want to tell you, God in you has made you and given you the ability to overcome. You are an overcomer. It may feel like the same thing, but you're responding with a different level of faith, with a different level of courage, and I want to tell you, you're going to make it through. We're going to be meeting soon as a church. I can feel it in my bones. There's going to be a shift and the churches will be able to meet again soon. I heard this story recently of a man who um, was walking uh, along a pathway by a dam and as he looked he saw a young girl throwing bread out to uh, the ducks and this lady was speaking in Spanish but the man understood Spanish and as she threw the bread out to these ducks um, she would say in Spanish, come, 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 come on ducks, come on, here's food, come on ducks. And as the man carried on walking past, he caught himself thinking, thinking but the ducks don't understand Spanish. <laughs> You're right, the ducks don't understand Spanish, English, Zulu, German, doesn't matter what language, but they understand what's communicated through actions. You see there, we're living in a time and an age where there are so many opinions, there are so many voices, but there is a lot less action. There is an ageless principle. Demonstration always speaks louder than words. Your demonstration, you don't need a demon. When you demonstrate love, it doesn't matter what language comes out of your mouth. In Romans chapter 5 verse 8, it says, but God demonstrated his own love to us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I want to tell you, church, love is a demonstration. You see, we don't give money to God because he needs it, but rather we demonstrate our love to God, not just in words. So often we say, oh, I've given my life to God and, you know, I read the word, but that's all wonderful. But step up and let's act on that. Father, I give you my tithes. God, I, I'm generous with my resource. I give um, uh, my offerings because, Lord, I'm not just you demonstrated your love. And Lord, I want to demonstrate if you've given your life to Jesus. What does that mean? It means your life is not your own. Your stuff is not your own. Your things are not your own. And when you give a small amount, a tithe, when you give an offering, you're demonstrating to God that your love is ju not just word deep, but it's demonstrated. Come on. I give my tithes and my offerings because I've made a conscious decision to demonstrate that I've given my life to Jesus. Church, I want to ask you, have you given up on giving or in the month of February, are you going to say, God, I'm not just going to worship you in my words, but Lord, I'm going to give you what means so much to me because God, you are worth way more in my life. You are at the center. You are on the throne. If you'd like to give, uh, I want to encourage you. Go on to our website. Our banking details are there. Vistachurch.co.za forward slash give. Our banking details are there. You can also give by snap scan. Come on. Um, there are so many ways to give. But I want to ask you, even when it's tough, you know, we are all going to come through this. We're going to get through this. But to be in the middle of the hot pot, to be in the middle of the pressure and say, but God, I demonstrated my love, even when things weren't going well. And the Lord, I believe, is going to bless you even in this present crisis. Well, at this moment, I'm going to hand over to our Vista anchors. Watch this.
Hey Vista Church, it is so great to see you and thank you for tuning in. Now today, we're out at the Blueberry Hills Hotel in Honeydew. Now, we're on the rooftop because we're always coming up higher. And what a 360 degree view of the West Rand. I mean, I'm lost for words. Now, if you need a place for your next meeting, why don't you drop by for a coffee? Hey Vista Church, we are so glad you've joined us today. Family, we miss seeing you face to face, but rest assured, we premiere every Sunday at 9 a.m. on Facebook and on YouTube. Our sermons are also available on our website. And if you haven't done so yet, you need to like our Instagram and Facebook page for daily encouragement from our awesome pastors. And on this Thursday at 7 p.m., we're gonna be meeting as a family via Zoom. So be sure to be there to encourage each other, to meet with one another, and to spend quality time with our pastors. Now, I have got some more awesome news for you. It's been a long time coming, but Vista Hike Club is back, and we have another exciting hike planned for you that'll be happening in Kingscliff, Mulder's Drift, Saturday, the 27th of February. Now, Vista Hike Club is a wonderful opportunity to invite somebody along who may not be so interested in church to come hang with some awesome people now for more information all you got to do is check out facebook.com forward slash vista hike club now, i got a challenge for you who are you gonna bring with i got names dada i got names well church it's that time to get into an awesome word with our gorgeous pastor b so i encourage you grab your notebook grab your bible grab your fancy pens and let's take it higher Thank you so much for tuning in online. I am so excited to share the Word of God with you today. I really believe I've got a word of encouragement just for you. And I've called today's sermon, Hold On Tight to your dream. Let's start by giving God some honor and some glory because He is faithful, He is good, and He is God. Amen. And I really want to encourage you today. Never limit your faith and your vision to your current set of circumstances or even the current resources that you have. Don't limit your faith, even in a season of COVID, even in a pandemic, an unprecedented time. God is a able to do exceedingly abundantly more than you could ever possibly ask for or imagine. That's who God is. So Vista Church, it is time for you to come up higher in your faith, to trust God at His Word. You know, God wants you to speak your world. What do I mean by that? I mean to say that God wants to hear you say it. He wants to hear you say what you are trusting Him for with your own mouth and with your own words. What are you trusting? for in your health? What are you trusting for with your family, your finance, even in your walk with God? What do you want to see Him do in your world? Let me tell you something. Your words have so much power and God can do something so supernatural for you. Come on. All you have to do is walk in faith, is talk in faith, is live by faith. That's what you have to do. You know what? I want you to know, you've heard me say this before, I'm going to say it again. The enemy doesn't want you to make it because he knows that the moment you realize God's plan for your life, he is in a whole bunch of trouble. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on. You see, your past is behind you. Your promises are still ahead of you. Yesterday is heavy. You need to put it down. You need to focus on what God has for you. He's got good things for you. But you see, to get there, we need to be resolute in our faith and to walk with God. We need to come um, with, no matter what comes our way, we need, to, we need to come to Him. And instead of shrinking back in life when the going gets a little bit tough, 
God wants us to rise up, to stand tall, to, uh, to be in his full authority and to hold on tight to the dream, to his dream. You see, if only you could get a revelation of just how powerful you are when you live your life by faith, come on. The moment you wake up in the morning and your foot hits the floor, the carpet in your bedroom, all of hell should be shaking in fear. Not only because you walk in hope, which is that confident faith. Not only because you walk in the full and mighty authority of God by the power of the Holy Spirit, but also because you carry a dream, a God-given dream. You carry His dream. So I want you to say this after me. I am a dream carrier. Come on, Vista Church. You are a dream carrier today. Now, you may not be where you want to be, and I'm going to say yet. Come on, say yet. I may not be where I want to be yet, but man, oh man, am I on my way. So don't be deceived in believing that you won't get there. Don't you dare give up on the promises of God for your life. He is still God, and He is still in control. Let me remind you what Joshua 1 verse 9 says. Says. This is God speaking and he says, have I not commanded you? He doesn't say, have I not asked or suggested? It's commanded. He's like, come on. Have I not told you to be strong and be courageous and do not be afraid and to not be discouraged? For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Wherever you go, there is no place you are going where God is not with you. Come on now. Now, I know that there are parts of your life that you did not choose. I know that. There are parts of my life I never chose. I wouldn't have chosen them and I, I probably still wouldn't have chosen them. And I want to remind you today that the dysfunction of your past does not determine the direction of your destiny. Come on, get a pen and write this down. The dysfunction of your past does not determine the direction of your destiny. God has a plan. The real truth is that when God formed you in your mother's womb, he had a plan for you, a plan to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That is God's hope and plan for your life. God has a promise for your life, a divine purpose, and he will never change his mind about you. Wow. You know, God is never going to change his mind about you. He doesn't go, hmm, you know, that Bianca, I had her on that trajectory, but I'm not sure anymore. God is never going to do that. Come on. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You know, I'm here to tell you that there is no person, no circumstance, no dysfunctional family, no demon in hell that can change God's mind about you, that can change his plans, his promises, his purpose, his destiny for you. Wow. But <laughs> the only thing that can stop you is you. You see, God, you know, he is not a man that he should lie. So if he said it, it is done. Boom, just like that. If God said it, it's done. But it is up to you to make sure that whatever he puts in your hand is protected and is carried well. He leaves that in your hands. It's up to you to submit to God as he prepares you, as you walk through the process to reach his promise. That part is up to you. The question I want to ask today is, can God be glorified with what is already in your hands right now? Is he being glorified or are we in process to getting there? The dream that God gives you is far greater, far bigger, much more than you could ever comprehend. But can you see past yourself and can you see his plan? Wow. I know it's hard when you come from a really difficult set of circumstances or a past. Maybe right now your situation is tough. 
But I know one thing, as Christ followers, as believers, we need to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus so that we can run our race with endurance. God wants us to press into Him, to know Him, to hold on tight to the dreams He places in our heart so that we can become all that He has planned for us to be. And so today, I want to take a little closer look at a person in the Bible, an amazing story of an amazing young man who God had amazing plans for. His name was Joseph, and you can find his story in Genesis from chapter 37 right through to chapter 44. Joseph was a dreamer. Joseph had a massive destiny, and Joseph's story can surely encourage us today. You see, Joseph was a man who was faithful with the little things and God made him a ruler over great things. But between the dream and realizing the promise, there was a 14 year process, 14 year process. Sounds like a long time, right? It was a process that God had designed to bring decrease in the areas of Joseph's life where he struggled with pride, where he struggled with the flesh arrogance and it was a process they got used to bring increase in humility in all the, the the values and the character that God needed so that God would be glorified and honored and so that he could carry the weight of the responsibility that God was placing on his shoulders Wow you see it takes a great amount of character to carry a great calling and a great anointing and God needed Joseph to get with the program to get ready for what he was going to carry for what was going to come and so let's talk a little bit about the life of Joseph and how he got there <laughs> those 14 years in between you see we always look at the highlights reel and see how he was such a great ruler but we don't always know what it took to get there you see Joseph grew up in an environment of jealousy of competition of insecurity he had many brothers and stepmothers and a sister and you know um, his dad was fighting with his uncle Esau <laughs> there was a lot going on in that family and so he, he, it wasn't a walk in the park for him. It wasn't a picnic. But I love how the Bible cuts right to the chase in Genesis chapter 37 as we are introduced to this portion of Joseph's life. Immediately we see the tension in the home as we are introduced to a 17 year old boy who is full of ambition and life. His name is Joseph. And when Joseph, we see Joseph is highly favored by God. He is highly favored by his father. He is diligent. He is always good at what he does no matter what task he's given he always goes above and beyond he is wise beyond his years he is well built and he is well loved by most people just not his brothers and you know what Joseph knows it have you ever met someone like that they're so good but they know it <laughs> anyway his father favored him so much that the Bible tells him his father gave him a very special fine coat of many colors which made his favor stand out even more and be even more visible to those around him and this left his brothers feeling super jealous and hateful towards him they really didn't like him and you see I want you to know that God will give you gifts that will cause others to see your favor and don't be surprised if there if there is some dislike towards you because of that it comes with a package you see God has his hand of a promise over Joseph and he gives him two dreams these dreams are set in motion and as he speaks these dreams, these dreams set God's process in motion so that Joseph can reach the promise. You see, both dreams are a tell of Joseph's elevation and greatness and his leadership of his he, he is a leader of his family and everybody around him will bow to him and so when he tells his brother and his family his brothers and his family of this dream his brothers the Bible says they hate him even more. You know, that like, here's this little whippersnapper telling us, the youngest, the second youngest, he wants to rule this place. Who does he think he is? Doesn't he know? It makes them angry. You see, the other problem is that not once when Joseph was sharing 
his two dreams, did he ever say that God had given him this dream, that this was from God? You see, he only spoke of himself when he shared the details. Clearly, he was showing that he was not yet ready for the great responsibility that God was going to hand to him. And so it was important for him to go on a process. And that's exactly where God began. And so one day Joseph is sent out by his father. You know the story. He goes to go and check on his brothers who are tending to the sheep a few fields away. And as he approaches them, amongst themselves, they say, "Mm -hmm, here comes that dreamer. (laughs) Let's kill him and chuck him in this pit. We can rip his silly little garment. And then let's see what comes of all of his dreams. They're almost mocking him and they're like, yeah, let's see what comes of his dreams, this big old dreamer. And, you know, for me, when you realize the dream that God has for you, you need to understand that suddenly you are powerful and you are a threat. (laughs) You are a threat to the enemy. And I have no doubt that the enemy will try, just as John 10, 10 says, he will try to steal, kill and destroy what God has set in motion for your life. The enemy is constantly trying to thwart what God has set in motion and planned for you. That's his, that's his job. He stands there going, ha ha, let's see this dream come to pass. Left wing, right wing tries to, tries to throw things at you, to distract you, to take you off course. And so when Joseph arrives at his brothers, he, he was probably whistling and all happy and hey, not realizing they plot to destroy him. And so they strip him of his coat. And they throw him into the empty pit. It's a cistern. It's a watering hole that was empty at the time. He would have fallen real hard and hurt himself real bad by falling in that pit. They didn't care. And you see, the brothers hated Joseph so much that they stripped him of the coat because they wanted to strip away his favor. They wanted to take away this glorious favor that he had and destroy his silly little dream and and, and his pride and his arrogance. But the reality is that they could not reach his dream. They could only reach what was handed to Joseph in the flesh, which was his coat. They could not touch his dream. They could only touch his coat. And I want to tell somebody today that it doesn't matter what your circumstances look like. It doesn't matter if you've lost something because of your circumstance, your family, your friends, your employment, or even the enemy. It doesn't matter what has been taken from you. Let me say this. God's dream still stands for your life. Your dream still stands. Nothing and no one can strip you of the promises of God. Come on. No person can strip you of the favor that God has on you. No person can stop God's plan and can take away the purposes that God has for your life. I love the story. There is so much in the story of Joseph. We won't have time to get into all of it today. I just want to get through some of it to inspire you. Because even though Joseph has now been stripped of his coat and thrown into a pit, You can already see God starting to work in the background. He starts to um, activate the process to get Joseph ready for the promise. God is always at work. And I can assure you, God is always on time. Come on. How do I know this? Pastor B, what are you saying? Let me show you. You see, one of the brothers convinces the rest of the brothers not to kill Joseph, but rather to leave him in the pit. And as they are sitting having lunch, they notice that there is a caravan of travelers coming. They're coming past en route to Egypt, where they will sell some of their produce. And so they have a bright idea. They decide to gain from Joseph's misfortune by selling him as a slave and making 20 pieces of silver, which they can divide amongst themselves. And they ripped his precious little coat and they covered it in animal's blood and they told his dad that he was killed. 
But what they saw as an opportunity to get rid of Joseph, God used as part of his process to get Joseph closer to his promise. While Joseph is in the pit, God is already organizing his transportation to Egypt. Come on. I love it. Don't you love it? When God sends a rescue plan, I love it. Joseph was one step closer in the natural as he sat in the back of a wagon, <laughs> probably with all of their produce, en route to the destination of his destiny. He didn't know it, but God was doing it. He was also one step closer in his character. You see, his pride was stripped away when his coat was stripped away and when he was sold as a slave. And while that was happening, his humility, which is what God needed, began to grow. And in all of this, in all of this horror, in all of this hardship, not once does Joseph lose sight of his dream. Not once. He held on tight to his dream. And so in Egypt, when they get there, the travelers decide to sell Joseph to a man named Potiphar. You know, Potiphar, he was an officer of Pharaoh. The Bible says he was a captain of the guard. That means he was a pretty big deal and pretty powerful. And I want to just park there and say that a slave is, is unknown to his master. So here is Joseph, who is his dad's favorite. He gets special coats and special treatments and he's always right. And he is sold for nothing and he becomes nothing. And he becomes a slave, which means that his potential, his skill and his accomplishments would have to be proven all over again. He would have to start at the bottom and he would have to start at the lowest level of servanthood. He would have to serve his way to the top if he wanted in this new life life that seemed to form around him to be anything. You see, but God did not mean this for Joseph's harm. You see, what God was trying to do in this space, he took the circumstance and he said, Joseph, this is where you will be developed, your skill, your character, just to get you ready for the incredible plan I have for you. You see, the Bible tells us that even though Joseph was now a slave, he was blessed by God. And he finds favor again with Potiphar. Joseph is so good that wherever he goes, he's favored. Come on, you know God's got his hand on you. When you walk into a place and you're meant to be a slave, and in just a short moment, you are running the place. That's who he was. Though he was young, he proved to be wise, industrious, and trustworthy. And so he was put in charge very quickly over the household staff and over all of the affairs of the house. How amazing is that? So Joseph made the best of his situation and he served his master wholeheartedly. He served with the gifts and the talents that he was given. And in doing so, he was blessed and Potiphar was blessed. And Potiphar knew that God's hand was on him. That is so amazing. How many times have you faced a difficult situation and you don't rise to the occasion to show that you are highly favored. Instead, you shrink back. God is saying to you today, now is not the time. Now is the time to walk in your favor, to walk in my power, to walk in my promise, to hold on to my, my, my dream for you. You see, things turned out pretty well for Joseph until, <laughs> I never like an until, Usually an until has a whole lot of other stuff coming at you. Until one day Potiphar's wife made a move on Joseph. She had her moves. She came out in a special outfit and she tried to seduce him. You see, Joseph was innocent. He was a godly man. And so because of that, he refused to betray his master. He refused to betray Potiphar and he would not do that to God. You see, I want you to know that the enemy is always looking for a way for you to lay down your favor by submitting to your flesh. Can you get that today? He's always trying to present you with options that seem great, all in the name of getting you to drop your guard and to lose your favor. But we are victorious, right? And we do not need to succumb to the deception and the foolery, the tomfoolery. Hashtag, I am more than a conqueror. <laughs> Come on. 
And so Potiphar's wife spitefully accuses him and Joseph has done nothing wrong to her. But Potiphar is angry and even though Joseph is innocent, he is still sent to jail, an innocent man wrongfully accused. Joseph doesn't even defend himself. Now you might say, what? Here's the thing. Who needs to chase down a lie? Who needs to chase down a lie? Come on, Vista Church. If my God is for me, if I am innocent, and if my God is for me, then who can stand against me? No weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. Come on. God says all you need to do is stand still and hold on tight to your dream, to your promise, and I will do the rest. I really believe that's a word for someone today. And even though Joseph found himself completely vulnerable, he was already a slave. Now he's not just a slave, but he's got this massive accusation on his back. He finds himself expendable to other people. He, is, uh, he, he, he kept on remaining faithful to God and faithful to his master, even under difficult and unjust circumstances. And he just keeps holding on to his dream. He just keeps holding on to his faith. He just keeps holding on to God. God. You see, his humility was growing. He was getting closer to his promise. Even though he couldn't see it, even though he couldn't feel it, he was getting closer. He was nearly there. And God was just getting ready, just getting him one step closer. You see, humility really is a spiritual remedy for pride. <laughs> You've got to work on that. We all have to work on that. You see, as a boy, he was a boy with a dream and Joseph wanted admiration. He wanted recognition. He wanted greatness. He wanted, um, he wanted power and he was ambitious and he was super boastful. And that arrogance was super annoying to a lot of people that didn't like him, like his brothers. But as a man, because you see, these things make you into who you become. As a man, he was becoming humble. And through all of these hardships, all of these difficult times, this major loss that he had in his life, he's lost his family, he's lost his belongings, he's lost a sense of worth, he's lost everything in this exceptional set of circumstances. He experiences God. He realizes that it's really God that needs to make this happen for me because there is nothing I can do in the flesh, in the natural, that is going to get me there. It has to be dependent on God. And so Joseph spends a couple of years in prison. And once again, the Bible says that while he's in prison, because he is highly favored, he is blessed by God, he, he's favored by the prison keeper, and he gets put in charge of all the other prisoners with complete trust. This guy soars like an eagle. I love him. Wherever he goes, it doesn't matter how terrible his circumstance. God blesses him. He, he really embraces who he is and he gives his best. He holds on to his dream. It's not good enough that he's in prison. He needs to be the leader there because he is going to be a leader because he had a dream. He had a God dream. We see Joseph starts to prosper again in his new role in the prison. I love it because he has a leadership mantle on his life because all Joseph needed was humility to take him to the next step. And so this is the part of Joseph's story that I find mind blowing. You see, God never changes his mind about you. He never changes his plan for you. He never changed his mind about Joseph or his plans for Joseph. Joseph was in a prison, but get this, he was right in the middle of the place of his promise while he was in prison. There he sat in a prison cell, not even knowing that right outside that prison cell door was the very promise that he dreamt about as a 17 year old boy waiting for one moment, waiting for one suddenly from God. He didn't know how close he was. Man, I bet you if he knew how close he was, he would be kicking himself. <laughs> Have you ever asked yourself how close you are to the promise that God has given you? 
Just because you can't see it, it doesn't mean it isn't there. It doesn't mean it's not right in front of you. It doesn't mean that God hasn't got it waiting for you. Let me tell you, God has not changed his mind about you. So while Joseph is in prison, God sends in a cupbearer and a, a baker to see if Joseph is ready to step out into the fullness of his promise. God sends him a test. The cupbearer and the baker, they, they, they come into to the jail for something they've done and they start telling Joseph of dreams that they have had and Joseph is actually able to interpret those dreams. How cool is that? And this time, you see, Joseph interprets the dreams and again, never mentions God. Doesn't say that um, God gives, me this, gives you this dream. But instead, even though he has a perfect opportunity to talk about God, I mean, he could really think about it. He could say to them, listen, I've interpreted this dream because God gave me this gift. So when you get out and you go to Pharaoh, you tell Pharaoh that God did this. You tell Pharaoh that God is powerful. You tell Pharaoh that, that God told me to say this to you. You go tell Pharaoh about God. You see, this is the last test that God is waiting for Joseph to shine, to pass, to succeed in. But instead, in Genesis 40, verse 14 to 15, Joseph says, something like this. Let me read it to you. He says, but when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off the land of the Hebrews and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in this dungeon. Remember me. You see, God was ready to present Joseph to his promise, but Joseph is still all about Joseph. And you see, you have to realize that if you're going to hold on to the dream of God, that dream God gave you is bigger than you. And it cannot be only about you, no matter how tough it is. It has to be about God. We have to put God in his rightful place. You see, this had me on my knees because <sighs> Joseph goes on to spend two more years inside a prison, inside his promise. Two more years for him to realize. How many times has God given me an opportunity to be faithful to him? To show him that I, I love him, to show him that I worship him, to show him I'm ready for what he has for me, to show him my growth and my maturity, that I'm full of faith and I'm ready. I'm ready to be all he has chosen me to be. How many times when the opportunity presents itself, have I put him first? Have I glorified his name over my name? Have I, have I offered my gifts and my service? Have I offered my, my finance and my heart over my own needs? Could I be stuck in the heart of a promise? And could something I have done be holding me back like it did with Joseph? Ooh, it had me. You see, ask yourself, what is holding your prison door closed? For Joseph, it was still his pride and it took a little longer. But maybe for you today, it's an insecurity. It's, it could be your depression, pride, wrong choices, lack of faith. Maybe there's some sin in your life that you just cannot let go of. You know, God has taken you through a process to get you this far because he wants you to go all the way to the promise. But some of the parts of the process are for you to handle, are for you to work through, are for you to grow in. And so he's going to test you along the way. And I love this. You see, the thing is that God never gives up on us. He never gave up on Joseph. Even though it took him a little bit longer to come around, he doesn't change his plan for Joseph. And while Joseph is getting ready, there's something else happening in the world. See, God's plan for us will never change, even if it takes us a little bit longer. And so Joseph sat in a prison for another two years until suddenly, ooh, and I love a suddenly, until suddenly 
Pharaoh has a very strange dream and God gives another opportunity because the cupbearer, all of a sudden, after two years, all of a sudden, he remembers, wait a second, there was a guy who interpreted one of my dreams. I think his name is Joseph. He's stuck down there in prison. You should probably call on him. And don't you love it that in that moment, Joseph is fully ready to be used by God and to give God the glory this time. And so he successfully interprets the dream which Pharaoh has, the seven years of harvest and the seven years of famine. And nothing was lost for Joseph because he was so, he had so much still to gain. Even though those 13 years were tough, what was about to happen would change his life. You see, Pharaoh was so impressed by Joseph because while Joseph was going through the 13 years of a process, he was learning, he was developing, he was brushing up his skills, he was becoming strong and mighty and a true leader of God. And while that was happening, when it took time for him to stand before Pharaoh, not only did he interpret the dream, but his leadership gift, his abilities, his wisdom came rushing in and he was able to give a cool strategy so that Pharaoh was so impressed that overnight he became, he was elected the prime minister of Egypt. Yesterday he was sitting in a prison not knowing when or where but he just knew he had a dream and he clung to it and today he walks in uses the gift that God gives him gives God the glory and he is put in charge of Egypt the most powerful nation come on I love how God does things like that in just a moment. You see, God can push fast forward on your promise. God can push fast forward in your famine. God knows exactly what he is doing and all he asks is get ready, get ready, get ready because when he wants to push go, he's got something so great for you. I love it because then, it's not even done then, in a divine twist of circumstances, there is a famine in the land which was predicted by the dream and the famine places Joseph's brothers right in front of him. Get this. And before they realize who he was, they find themselves bowing to him. Just like in Joseph's dream, when those, um, those sheaves of grain were bowing to him. And you know what I love about this picture, this dream specifically, is in Joseph's dream as a 17-year-old boy, he thought that those sheaves of grain were a representation of his brother, his brothers, and that he would be, probably thought he would be the boss of the family farm. He had no idea, fast forward, that he would be sat in front of his brothers as the ruler of Egypt, and they would be bowing in front of him for the very food, the very shaft of grain that he dreamed about come on that wasn't just some wild dream of some little 17 year old who was arrogant and proud that was a dream that God had planted in Joseph's heart that was a dream of a purpose that God needed to fulfill a promise that God wanted to give Joseph and he needed it because he wanted to do something magnificent for the descendants of Abraham this was bigger than Joseph he needed to get the people back into Egypt so that he could start to do some miracle work. I love it. The story ends with Joseph revealing himself to his brothers and his father. I'd love you to read it at home. And you know what happens? Joseph forgives his brothers for everything they've done to him. And he says the magnificent words that we quote so often in Genesis 50 verse 20. He says, as for you. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Wow. If I've ever seen God's perspective on a tough situation, this is it. As you, as for you, what you meant for evil against me, God used it to bring it about that many would be saved. If we could start to see that God will use your circumstance to bring it about that His name is glorified, that her, His purposes prevail in your life, and that your promise comes to pass. Joseph continued to use all of God, of who God made him to be, to prosper in every 
situation. From the pit to Potiphar's house to the prison and to the palace. Joseph knew that he couldn't always control his circumstances, but he could choose how to handle them. And he chose to hold on tight to his dream. Vista Church, I want to say, fix your eyes on the promises of God and never let go. God can take you right out of your prison and in a moment you can be sat as a prime minister in your palace because those are the plans he has for you, plans to prosper you, plans to, for a hope and a good future for you. He can turn fa your famine into favor. He can use any set of circumstances, but would you just cling to the promise and keep pressing on? Don't let go. Speak your world. Trust God that he will bring the increase. Trust him in the process. Even when you're in the pit and all you can see is up and it's just a bit of sunlight you're hoping. Trust him then. Trust him when you're in the back of the wagon as a slave. You trust him then. Trust him when you are in part of his house and you wrongly. Trust him then. When times are tough, remember that what was meant for your harm, God can and he will use for your good. God loves you. He is with you and he has got you. God's got you. Come on, Vista Church. So I really hope that when you find yourself in a tough time, you'll reflect back onto Joseph's story for encouragement, that you would cling to faith in God because he loves you, he is with you, and he has got you. Well, I really hope that that word has encouraged you in your space today. I hope that you could find yourself in that story today. Let's, let's close with a bit of prayer. Let's say, Father, we want to put all our trust in you. We thank you, God, that you are in charge, that you are in control, and that no matter what it looks like, in the natural, no matter what is stripped away, no matter what is torn apart, your purposes will always prevail because no man, no enemy can separate us and can cancel the plans you have for us. And so today we commit to hold on tight to the dream, the dream you've placed in our hearts, to go through the process and to live out the incredible promises that you have purpose for our lives. Amen and amen. Man, well, maybe you've been watching today and you haven't yet invited Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. I want to tell you that that is the best decision you could ever make with your, in your life. And in this moment, as you make a decision, if that's you today, I want you to know that God can do a miracle right where you are sitting. God doesn't just restore you when you give your life to Him. He makes you new. You know, the Bible says that God sent His only Son, Jesus, to take our place on the cross so that we could live a life that is right before him so that we could live a life that is free from sin and shame that is beautiful that is full of purpose and full of power and one day we can enjoy eternal life with him in the heavenly realms and so today maybe until today you've never really made a decision to follow Jesus but maybe today you say I want me some of that I want to follow Jesus I want to live my best life I want to live serving his purposes well today if that's you I want you to know that Jesus will bring you love grace healing and wholeness you are forgiven and so if that is you, I want to say a prayer right now and I want you, wherever you find yourself, to repeat this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for taking my place on that cross. Forgive me for all of my sins, God. Forgive me for all of my transgressions. I pray, won't you make me new? I pray that today I choose you to be the Lord of my life, to be my Savior to be the one I put my trust in. And so today, Lord, I choose to follow you with all the days of my life as my King, as my Lord, as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, we are so excited if that was you, if you made a decision to follow Jesus today, we are so excited for you. We want to connect with you, we would love to pray for you and we'd love to get a free resource to you. And all we ask is that you would either pop a direct message on the comments or perhaps you could just send us an email info at vistachurch.co.za and we can get that resource right to you because today your life has changed. That is so awesome. So we are so excited for you. Well, right now, I want to encourage you to please stay tuned. We are going to go back into a time of powerful worship. And while you're worshiping, won't you position your heart in front of God and allow this word to percolate and to do a good work in you. And then straight after worship, I know the cool and awesome Vista Bear is back with a very cool story. So make sure you stick around for that. Vista Church, I love you. Enjoy the worship. God bless you as you go.
Hey kids, come over and see how many awesome fish I caught. <laughs> oh wow, so many fish. And look at that wiggly worm. A special lunch for the fish. Ew, that's gross. <laughs> Did you know that Jesus helped some men catch fish? One day, Jesus was standing by the lake, teaching the crowd around him the word of God. Jesus saw some fishermen near their boats, and they were washing their nets. Jesus got into the boat that belonged to Simon, and he continued to teach the crowd of people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Push the boat into deeper water, and let down the nets for a catch. But Simon answered, Hmm. Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Oh, man! But because you say so, I will give it a try. So they let down their nets, and all of a sudden, the nets were full of fish! They couldn't believe it! Even their nets began to break! So they called their friends in the other boat to come and help them! When their friends came to help, there were so many fish that they Whoa. filled both boats completely! The boats were so full that they began to sink! They were so amazed at this miracle and couldn't believe that Jesus could do such a great thing! Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will be fishers of men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything and followed Jesus and became his disciples, helping him to go out and teach the world about the love of God. <laughs> Isn't Jesus awesome? Hooray! And you and I get to be fishers of men too, which means we can tell other people about Jesus and the love of God. I love Jesus and want to tell the whole world! <laughs> That's awesome! Let's learn some Bible! Say after me! Matthew 4.19 Come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Matthew 4.19 Come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Well, kids, I have to run. But remember, God is always there for you. He loves you so much. Have a very good day. Thank you so much, Mr. Bear. We love you. Bye, Mr. Bear. And bye, Mr. Kids. We love you. Hooray! Let's go be fishers of men and tell the whole world about Jesus. Hooray! Vista, yeah. what a beautiful view from a high position. With Christ in the center, there is nothing missing. Yeah, we praise with open arms and we receive your gift. Revelation 4-1, come up here and I will show you what must happen after this. Yeah, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord.